see you. See how's, you. How's, how's Florida? No complaints. <laughs> You're over in San Agustin, no? Or around yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful place. Okay, let's see as we wait for everyone to join. Let's give them, give them a minute or so. Come on. Good to see everyone on this call. Here's a lot. Happy yeah. birthday again. I <laughs> got enough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's a big Jerry birthday. It's a lot. Howdy. Howdy. Oof. Okay. I think we got we got a pretty steady number. All right. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. Joining in from that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Joining in from everywhere, all corners of the world. Welcome to the uh, open virtual master course with the one and only Jerry White. Um, and it's so great seeing all these, all these, uh, all these screens, not four pages, at least on my end. Um, so yeah, just wanna give a quick shout out uh, to everyone that's, that's, that's in here. We have so many different groups joining us today. Uh, we have students who just uh, as of two days ago, um, graduated from the spring semester, spring 2020 semester here in Boulder, um, to students from Lynn University as well, currently completing uh, their bachelor's degree, and uh, alumni from across the world, like a lot. I just had a recent birthday, and I see Justina ah, from LA. So good to see you. Uh, Justina, hi. she's a graduate from, hi. She, Justina's a graduate from fall 2017, and a musician. Uh, her and I sang together. Anyhow, I can, I can tell stories about so many alumni, uh, as well as students from Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala, which is a um, new partner for us. Uh, we'll talk about a little more about that in just a bit, um, as well as a couple of uh, prospective students uh, or students who have applied to, to, to the Watson programs and some friends as well, some, commu some community friends as well. Fabiano, another alumni from Bolivia, hi. Um, so many different groups, so everyone, just like, thank you so much for, for being here. I actually wanted everyone to say hi, and I kind of just went through everyone, so <laughs> everyone's wave. <laughs> so, so great to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Jorge Mendez. I'm currently the Director of External Programs and Search here at Watson, and I'll actually be moving into the Director of Programs role for our Boulder program. Um, the semester accelerator here in Colorado, something I'm very, very excited about. Um, and We're counting down the here. days, Jorge. Counting, We're counting on the, down days. the days. We're gonna throw a party. Eric, Eric promised me a party. Just saying. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but um, yeah, and and I'm, I've been here for Watson for three years, and I, I'm looking forward to the next uh, couple of years as well. Now in a different role. Uh, working together with with the scholars, Watson scholars here in Boulder, and you know, it's. It, I, I was just talking to a couple of students right before this, like 15 minutes ago, <laughs> and I was sharing with them like what a privilege it is to be part of this program, and and, and to really, you know, be be part of a a movement that of 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 treating education and treating this this like system, um, as a vehicle, uh, as a conduit to make change in the world, um. And I shared something that Eric shared with me. Well, well he shares with many people. Uh, you know, what's the quickest way to impact a million people? Uh, and that is, you know, you impact a hundred and have them impact a thousand, all right? Or I think I did that math right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for me, it's an honor and a privilege to, to see our students graduate just how they did two days ago um, and see them go into the world and, 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 and change the world, change the community, but most importantly, also change themselves. Um, and become the leaders that I want to be. So for me, it's an honor to be going into this role and I even, even a bigger privilege to be part of the organization. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm based here in our Boulder program, the Semester Accelerator, um, which is a program for recent, recent high school or college or university graduates um, looking to either be part of a venture or launch a venture themselves that is uh, socially focused uh, and using entrepreneurship as a tool for social change. Um, I also mentioned we have students joining us from Lynn University. We have a program, a bachelor's in social entrepreneurship that we launched 
um, we launched on campus at Lynn University in 2018. Um, and we currently have two cohorts of incredibly amazing students who are majoring in their mission. Uh, so they're actually part of a bachelor's degree that takes all these different tools that we've come to perfect um, over in the, in the accelerator program that's only one semester and take it into a three-year bachelor's degree um, for students to build a career in social impact, social change, entrepreneurship, and using all these tools um, to graduate, like I mentioned, and major in their mission. And um, we also uh, have a third program that we are about to launch. Eric, it's happening like in like two weeks, right? Or three weeks? I think we're at Roughly? 18 days until day Ooh. one. 18 days until we launch a brand new program in Guatemala with our, our, our latest partner, uh, Universidad Francisco Marroquín, based in Guatemala. And this is the Career Accelerator. Um, it's a six week long um, career accelerator uh, for, for, student, for current students or graduates that are looking um, into launching a career in uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, social impact, uh, and so on. And uh, in addition to that, students from Universidad Francisco Marroquín, which is uh, UFM for short, uh, can actually earn a minor in impact entrepreneurship um, by completing this program. So um, actually, I would love to introduce someone about this water, uh, that can say a lot more about the Guatemala program than I can, and more eloquently for sure, um, in not one but two languages, uh, it's just Helda. Uh, Helda, she's a current director of programs for this new program in Guatemala. And, and Helda, I'd love for you to just share a little bit more. And I know we have a lot of students from Guatemala as well uh, joining us. So if you want to give a, a, a big description in Spanish as well, that'd be awesome. Okay. Yeah. Hola, Jorge. Hola, Eric. Hola, Jerry. ¿Cómo están? Hola a todos los estudiantes de la Marroquín. Estamos súper contentos por haber recibido tantas aplicaciones. Hemos recibido bastante eh, respuesta positiva de todos los estudiantes. Y este es como un espacio que tenemos para informar un poquito más acerca del programa. Como ustedes saben, yo soy exalumna de la Marroquín, también soy emprendedora. Y por eso considero que es un programa que, sí, que se puede ajustar muy bien a todas sus necesidades, que se puede ajustar sobre todo a esas personas que quieren hacer un cambio, hacer un impacto, ya sea social o creación de empresas, creación de lo que ustedes quieren dejar como un legado también, empezar desde que son jóvenes. Otra cosa que teníamos eh, que decir es de que hemos recibido unas aplicaciones increíbles de la Marroquín. Estamos súper contentos. También recordarles que tenemos el tema de las becas. Esa se va a basar en todas las, aplica en las aplicaciones que ustedes manden. Eh, también Jerry White, muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros de esta forma que, que tú has impactado a tantas personas y sé que va a ser de mucho beneficio para los estudiantes de la Marroquín acá en Guatemala. Para los que estén todavía interesados en aplicar para el programa, que todavía tenemos muchas aplicaciones que estamos procesando, les recordamos que, que tienen esta semana para aplicar. También eh, hay muchas personas que ya la estamos contactando para sus entrevistas, que ya les estamos dando seguimiento y también sé que muchas personas me han escrito el día de hoy que, van, que participaron aquí y que ya fueron aceptados para el programa. Entonces, felicidades a todos ustedes que ya están dentro de nuestro programa. Y por último, si tienen alguna consulta, alguna pregunta, yo voy a estar enviando un correo a todos los que están en este eh, Masterclass el día de hoy para, que, para darle seguimiento a cualquier duda o consulta, porque ya me, me han estado escribiendo algunas preguntas y he tratado de con, eh, contestarlas y quiero que todo este proceso sea lo más personalizado posible para ustedes y que desde el principio sea una experiencia increíble. O sea que los esperamos. Eh, acuérdense que estamos súper interesados en líderes, en gente que de verdad quiera causar impacto, no solo para ellos mismos, sino para nuestro país. Creo que esto va a ser un, un, una forma de educación diferente, que eso es lo que propone Watts, una forma de educación diferente para que las personas líderes que salgan de estos programas de verdad puedan causar un impacto en el lugar donde viven y para las personas que tienen alrededor. Entonces, espero recibir más información de ustedes, conocerlos mejor y gracias Jorge por, por darme este espacio sí, claro. y estamos ansiosos por, por escuchar esa masterclass de Jerry White. Sí, de verdad. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Hola. And towards, towards the end, she was like, we're anxious to, to, to get this masterclass started. I'm like, yeah, you're right. 
<laughs> I, I should shut up. I should shut up soon. Uh, <laughs> but just lastly, I just want to see where everyone's coming in from. China, Nigeria, Quebec, Canada. I love Quebec. I was there two years ago. Bangladesh, India, Aditya. Hi, Aditya. Uh, the alumni from last year, spring 2019. For anywho. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in learning more, feel free to, reach to, feel free to reach out to us. Um, also, on the follow-ups, we share uh, more information if you're interested in applying or learning more to any of these programs. And yeah, without further ado, I'm actually going to hand it over, the mic over, the virtual mic over to, to Eric. Jorge, thank you so much. Um, it is so good to see everyone here for this time with Jerry White. Um, for context, I'm the CEO and founder of Watson Institute and love seeing all the familiar faces on, on this master course in part because Jerry White has been one of our longest standing and most impactful master course teachers, um, really since Watson Institute started. And I remember the very first time um, Jerry and I met, it was before Watson Institute had even began. And I um, wandered into his office at the time at the U.S. State Department, having heard a tremendous amount about him and his wisdom. And so I was nervous because I really wanted him to be a master course teacher. And I walked into his office and we ended up sitting down and really diving in into a great conversation that I still remember to this day. And I walked in thinking I wanted him to be a master course teacher. And I walked out realizing I really wanted Jerry White to be my mentor personally. And so after that conversation and the walk that we had um, to his next meeting in DC, I went to the subway, uh, the Metro in DC. Before I got in the Metro, I remember just taking out my notebook and writing down everything that I had learned from the past hour and a half or two hours. Um, and a lot of those ideas around alignment, uh, what it means to live an aligned and impactful life are ideas that Jerry's going to talk about today. Um, he also is going to talk about resilience. And there's few people better to talk about resilience than Jerry White. Some of you have read his story. Um, some of you know what he has overcome, what he has done in this world to impact many people's lives. Um, but beyond the story you've read online, Jerry White is truly someone who demonstrates resilience up to this day. Because right before our master course, he had an emergency tooth surgery and shared with me a photo of the dentist's office where he was in surgery maybe half an hour ago. And I said, Jerry, are you okay? Are you gonna be able to join us? And he said, this is about resilience. The game must go on, the show must go on. So a huge hats off to Jerry for truly embodying what it means to be resilient. And then thank you, Jerry, for sharing with us these lessons of resilience, which are so relevant in a time like this. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jerry. Um, thank you for being such an incredible mentor and friend and for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. All right, guys, and thank all of you. What a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna explain a little more of the context. Normally, my wife said, don't do this. Like, you're not supposed to be talking for an hour. And so I won't go into the details of what happened, how my day was, but I will explain that normally I can smile normally like so you will only get a half jerry smile like i don't know obviously the rest is just collapsed stitches blood swollen so i'm much better looking than i appear today but i'm going to let you just see all of me hang out this is not one of those tapes you actually want circulating the world but vanity be gone so i will probably be talking a little slower i'm not on drugs so i won't be high during my talk but i will try to elevate our conversation on resilience today. And I brought, um, sent some slides that I think I'll use because they will help visualize. And also I know um, sometimes I speak fast or sometimes English isn't most people's second language. And now that I have a slur, I might not be as clear as I would like to be. So just beg your forgiveness in advance. I'm just in service and appreciation for Eric and Watson Institute. And all of you, I feel like you are my family. You are like my people, like social entrepreneurs who are impact entrepreneurs who are really led by the heart and who they are in the world. That's why I feel so comfortable so I don't have to put on any airs. I don't have to uh, have pretense. And I want you to ask, even interrupt, or in the chat room, keep the questions coming or comments. Um, let's just put everything on the table in terms of resilience because we are living in a very difficult time, a time that's unlike any other. 
at least in my lifetime, and I'm 56. Um, so with that, I think I'll just um, do share some slides. And I don't know if you can adjust the size or how I am on speaker view, but we'll see how it goes. Um, let's see here. And I will see. So you all can still see me okay? Okay. All right, so resilient leadership in a time of crisis. This is for you guys, custom. But it is true that I teach at the University of Virginia, and also I advise a business school in New York. And I, um, I teach and lecture elsewhere, but those are my sort of home bases in New York and outside Washington, DC at the University of Virginia. And I teach a class on religion, violence, and strategy. And um, it's about how to stop killing in the name of God. So the point of the class really is about strategy, and that's why it's relevant to all of you. Because you take an impossible topic like religion-related violence, which is the fastest growing violence around the world, and you think, how do you, quote, solve that? Well, you can't. So that's why strategy comes in, and we'll be thinking about strategy as an art, and a science, and a discipline. So here on the, um, before you is the six days of creation, what I call like the genesis of entrepreneurial strategy. And you must start with yourselves and where you are in the world right now today. First of all, what is your vision and what are your values? So we're gonna go to the second part of our class today, our course, we'll be delving more deeply into your values, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna skip to resilience pretty soon so we cover that first. So normally I would teach the class, the first day of creation is your vision and values. The second is the choices you're making and what you're not going to do and what you're going to do because strategy is not a comprehensive action plan. It's really leveraged and opportunistic and um, creative. You have to make difficult choices. The third is alignment, which we'll talk about as well in the second hour about how do you align who you are with how you see the world and the problems and what you do about it with your excellence, what you contribute uniquely in this process. The fourth day of creation of strategy is about balance, looking at your stakeholders, your partners, your teams, your own inner balance, as well as your outer balance, and then how to bring more ecological balance to the world as you do no harm with your strategies and your creative, innovative ideas. And then resilience, that's the fifth day of creation. And while we'll be covering five steps to overcoming life crises. And then integrity. At the end, that's like the metrics. Like, did you do what you said you were going to do? Were you standing for the values you said you stood for? Can you measure the impact and the outcomes that you were aiming for? So that brings us full circle to keep maintaining our vision and our values throughout the process. So now for resilience, which is normally the fifth day, but I'll start here. Here, you know, I don't know how old many of you are, but this is me with hair at 20 years old. And I'm in a hospital in Tel Aviv, Israel, where I spent six months of my life. And I don't know I don't remember this photograph being taken. I can hardly recognize the boy in the picture, but it's after stepping on a landmine and after a couple months of suffering in a hospital bed, it was time to go to physical therapy. So here I am, and to back up on the story, I was a student just like many of you, right? And I was 19 years old and I went to Israel. And I wanted to study Hebrew and the Bible and Middle East politics and foreign policy. And so I decided to do it in Jerusalem at Hebrew University. I was learning Hebrew, I was loving it. I mean, can you imagine just the privilege of walking in the footsteps of the prophets? It's lovely. But I didn't know that also those are deadly footprints to follow because there's nearly a million landmines spread throughout Israel and the territories. And the one that I stepped on was laid in 1967, when I was four years old, and it waited, let's say, 16 years until I went camping with two friends, was humming and happy on a beautiful sunny day, hiking down a hillside with my backpack and knapsack, and packed up, heading home, and boom, 
there was a terrible explosion and I was thrown on my face. And I looked down and saw that my foot was blown off. And you might imagine the trauma of like, where's my foot? Where's my foot? I can't imagine, where's my foot? I just kept chanting, where's my foot? Like someone find my foot. So needless to say, landmines do their jobs. They're designed to rip off body parts and to maim you, not to kill you. So mine did by chopping off my lower right leg and also my other leg where you see all the marks, that's where bones and um, debris were sticking out. I, had, I could look down and see bones sticking out. I could see my kneecap, for example, and then there were shrapnel and rocks that had actually exploded into my body. So a highly traumatic experience um, and very difficult, very painful each and every day. Um, and so when I look back, I was like, I look at this picture, feels like a very long time ago, but I'm proud of that kid. I'm proud of what he overcame. Years later, like over 10 years later, when I was in my early 30s, here I ended up working on the landmine issue with the Princess of Wales in the middle and Ken Rutherford on the left. Ken lost both his legs in Somalia to a landmine explosion while working as a humanitarian. And the two boys in the middle in Bosnia, they are um, a 14 year old on the right of Diana, Malic, who lost his leg. I think he was helping his father gather firewood you know, after the war, the war was over. And Jarko to the left of Diana, 12 years old, was going out to like run to the neighbor's house or get some food and then hopefully play soccer with his friends. And he lost one of his legs to a landmine. Again, in both cases, these boys, the father watched the carnage. So it's not, around the world, as we all know, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of violence and a lot of landmines. But I didn't know that when I was 20 years old in that hospital, that there were you know, 60 to 80 million landmines buried in over 80 countries. And then this is a click. 80% of the victims are not soldiers. They're civilians, like you, like me. I was a tourist, but you're talking about children. You're talking about farmers. You're talking about women. You're talking about refugees. You're talking about your neighbor. So Diana on this trip in, this is August, 1997, and the boys are the age of Prince Harry and Prince William, 12 and 14 at the time. And after this visit, Diana says, it's so interesting. Every time you introduce me to a survivor, they tell me their date. I was like, well, I'm April 12th, 1984. That's when I stepped on a mine. And Ken chimes in and says, I'm December 16th, 1993. And then the princess says, you know what? I think I'm July 29th, 1981. And then she burst out laughing because I didn't get it, but she goes, that's the day she married Prince Charles. So here was a princess who was actually defining trauma in the most emotionally intelligent way. Trauma is a before and after moment where your life is never the same. It could be a wedding, it could be a baby, it could be a landmine injury. Life can explode or it can come on you with lots of fame and blessing and money. What is trauma is an interesting question, but we're defining it here today as a before and after moment or before and after opportunity, a crisis. So when we're thinking about trauma, something awful goes on, you know, now it's 2020. This is a year that will be a before and after moment, right? Life is not going to be the same. There's no going backward anyway, but in a global pandemic and a global you know, emergent depression and with climate catastrophe and all the things we're inheriting and working on together in all our different ways around the world, that's why we have something like the Watson Institute for those of us who are already seeing the trouble and wanting to intervene with love. So look at victimhood the, the, at the bottom. And again, I apologize with my pronunciation. I'm 
I'm trying my best. The hallmarks of victimhood are when you are stuck in the past. This awful thing has happened to you and you're stuck there. Or maybe it's a country like 9-11. The US is wounded, 3,000 people dead, the Twin Towers are down. But if we stay in the past and deal with everything as if it's 9-11 or if it's terrorism, not healthy. We know also when we are hurt, deeply hurt and traumatized, we can feel sorry for ourselves, self-pity. No one understands it. No one understands my depression. No one sees me, the pain I've been through. Normal. We're not blaming or judging here. And then there's resentment. Ugh. You find yourself, even like your best friend gets a job and you're resenting that. Why didn't I get the job? How come he's so lucky? And then blaming. Well, you know, never take responsibility. It's always someone else. Blaming is also a hallmark of victimhood. And taking. You know, in my case, like, you can't give my leg back. Like, nothing that you pay me can have my leg grow back. So, in fact, when you're in a victim space and you stay there, you can get infected with an insatiable need for other people to keep giving to you, and you become a taker, which is the opposite of resilient survivor or leader, where one of the hallmarks is generosity and giving. So I want to walk us through the five steps of survivorship, your, your recipe for resilience, and also as we do it, like open up to questions that um, Eric can moderate, because I want in each case us to really look at where you are right now, um, and then how do these five steps apply to your current situation or your life. So survivorship first is something I define as living positively or dynamically in the face of trauma or disease, disaster, disability, destruction, death, you know, all those awful D words in English. Living positively in spite of. So what are the five things we need to do? Number one is face facts. And for me, when I was in the hospital, when I first was learning about resilience from landmine survivors and also from my own experience, this is the hardest step. When I was in that minefield and I said, where's my foot? I was still looking for my foot for about two years, somehow thinking it might grow back, that this nightmare would be over. But I was in denial. So I did a lot of things. On the one hand, I wasn't in my, I was running to get a prosthesis and go back to school and uh, pr prove to everyone that there was nothing wrong with Jerry White and that I hardly noticed that I was missing my leg. I wanted to prove myself. So it wasn't until about two years later that I had to face the fact, not only that I wasn't a starfish growing back my leg, but also that I was terribly sad and angry, but all alone. Not many people saw that side of me and how I cried when I was alone. So what are your facts? Just in this like COVID time, when I was thinking about this, you know, I have two, three friends who have actually already died. They were elderly, but have already died from COVID. I have five other friends who have lost their mothers and fathers without being able to say goodbye through a hospital window or face in the time of COVID. I'm here and I am here and very blessed to be with my wife in Florida. It's warm, we can get outside, we're not sick. Um, but I worry about my elderly mother and her confusion with Alzheimer's. What is this disease? Do you have it down there, she says, from Boston. She doesn't know what it is. And she doesn't know why she's locked up you know, on a lockdown in an elderly facility. Can't even go and pick a flower. So for me, very often people look at me and say, oh, what, are you, what facts are you facing? And there's that landmine, that I have a fake leg. Like, I think I've dealt with, I've, I've overcome, I, I understand that one. <laughs> 
But my today's facts is really about aging and preparing to grieve and say goodbye to my mother or think, will I see her again? Will I touch and hold her hand? So that's mine. So I ask each of everyone, it's not to be so dramatic, but in fact, these are not normal times. If you think they are, <clears throat> it's called denial. If you think this is business as usual, even because you're in a lucky situation, God bless. But the world is in a whole lot of hurt. So just take number, put number one and say number one, face facts. Name a, one of your pieces of situation that is really bugging you out that people might not know about. I'm not gonna call you out, but write down, what is your fact? And then what is the feeling next to it? Because you can't really get beyond it and integrate it and become strong and resilient unless you understand this first step. Do the math on your life, including the feelings and your fears. Anyone want to share a fact or have a question about facts? I can't read the chat, so Eric, you'll have to either unmute or share. If people want to share, please add it to the chat box and we will call you out to share it. Lalas, thank you for sharing. Can, um, if you'd like, would you like to share with the group? We'll get you unmuted in a sec. Yeah, please feel free to unmute and, and share with the group. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, Jerry, long time no see. It's my third time seeing you uh, in person, but this time virtually. I'm right now in China. And I'm just really, really grateful and uh, glad uh, that we're all here together to, you know, to embrace resilience and uh, to really, um, you know, try to um, lift each other up during this hard time. Uh, me personally, um, despite the fact that we're all in this COVID thing together, uh, my mom, she's suffering from cancer um, since 2013. And she's a brave, brave woman uh, that I'm really, really lucky that she's been, you know, um, uh, being strong, staying strong for, for this long. Um, but recently things are um, deteriorating really fast. Um, but, um, you know, we're still hoping for the best. It's just like the COVID thing makes it really complicated. Usually when she um, uh, did camo, someone has to be, you know, in the hospital cell, uh, not cells, hospital room with her. But uh, right now, because of the, uh, the situation, like no one can be there with her. She has to go there by herself each time because it's obviously like too dangerous. Um, both for the patients and for other people. So I totally feel you, how you feel about your mom. And I guess like a lot of us feel related to, um, just um, keep strong everyone. And I wish you all the best out there. Thank you, Thank you Lalas. We'll do one more and then Jerry, time-wise, we should probably move into the second step. So Eve, would you be willing to share? And for context, everyone, Eve is an amazing Watson Institute alumni, as is Alice. Um, Eve is staying up late from Bangladesh. She was recently named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Congratulations, Eve. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we'd love for you to share your fact. Thank you, Eric. Hi, Jerry. It's been an honor listening to you. I always follow you, and I just love listening to you. So 
right now considering our situation because i run an organization which is kind of like hybrid like we have social entrepreneurship in one side another side we are running charity based projects and because of the current situation economy is really bad people are losing their jobs the people are less interested in donating or uh, doing partnerships even investing so I'm really scared, like how, what I, though I have uh, reserve funding for next uh, four months, but still I'm scared, like how I'll survive, will I be able to pay my employees, how I'm gonna play, uh, pay the operation costs, like rents, bills and everything. And I have lots of people looking upon me, like my beneficiaries, people I help, I work for my employees and also many people are looking upon me because uh, they think i am doing something really great like my family members like people relative and i don't want to lose that image that uh, situation so i'm just really scared that how i'm gonna go through this mm -hmm. thank you thank you Eve. well said eve um, and Jerry, we have a question in the chat box uh, from Rizalat. So I'll let you choose if you want to answer it now or move into the second step and answer it as we go. But the question is, I'm curious, Jerry, how have you seen the dynamics of victimhood manifest themselves in the context of everyday experiences? And what lessons should we be aware of while we engage with it and try to move past it? Good question. I think that we'll, you'll hear more maybe on the course of the call, I'll answer the second question, or uh, Brissola, thank you for that, and Eve as well. So as we move from facing the facts, I think that's wonderful, Eve, just to be that honest. Also, because, but then, then what we have to think, if we're feeling fear as a leader, everyone else is feeling fear, and the ripple effect is fearful. You know, fear times a thousand. So it's important as a leader to face those facts and be vulnerable in your fear. It doesn't mean you overshare everything, but you are doing your work on yourself because that will ripple effect more calm, which means courage in the face of fear. It takes courage to face facts. And one of the challenging facts for special leaders like yourselves is the fear of not being like, you know, the fear of flaws and the fear of vulnerability and the fear of the, when a crisis comes, it makes us all equal. There's no beneficiary, there's no boss. There's just like fear and trauma. And so on one hand, if we think of face the feelings and, and sit with your fear, feel it in your body. Do not run in the face of fear. That, you know, you're frightened, you want to fly, you know, they say flight, or fight or freeze. You want to, you'll be tempted to do all three, but instead you want to step in to face facts and do the math. And if you're feeling a certain thing on a certain day, you're angry one hour and you're crying the next, and you're, you have to go in and respond to where in your body are you feeling the fear? When have you felt it before? Because otherwise that trauma from your past is infecting the current moment and augmenting your fear, it multiplies. So unless you as a leader know yourself and know like, oh, I felt that in my body before. Oh, that was when I was 13. Oh yeah, also when I was five. So you, there are exercises to do to go into your acupressure points, but mostly just sit with your facts, your feelings and your fears. And you'll squirm and you'll want to run. And it only helped me being in a hospital bed for six months. They're like, I had nowhere to run. I had a lot of time to lie and sit with my fears. So at first, in this first phase, that's what I would say. Sit with it, feel it fully, lean into it and understand. So if you're aware enough, those fears won't dominate your leadership and your choices. Um, same thing with our choices about or mothers or any other thing where you can panic and react. What you want to do is feel and then respond. So number two, we want to be more than these awful days. I know that I'm more than a landmine or a fake leg. 
So choose life is the second step, which just means you have hope or faith, or you just believe that your life won't be forever defined by this pain. Just like in a trunk of a tree, there may be a dark circle. That's only one of the years. So choosing life, they say that people who believe who have spirituality or know they're more than their body, at least have that story, make meaning, they have a competitive advantage in survivorship, being able to make meaning and know that your life has more purpose than this pain. You're bigger than all that. So choose life, an example was Jesus Martinez, El Salvador. He also um, steps on a landmine when he's 16 years old. He loses both his legs on the spot. He wants to die. And he reaches over like to grab anything, you know, to, to grab a, a landmine and starts like hit it against his body on the ground, wanting it to explode so he would die. So that, that's not choosing life. There's a choice of death. He wanted to die and the landmine didn't go off a second time. And then he came and a soldier was walking by and he begged the soldier, shoot me, kill me, put me out of my misery. And the soldier refused. But later on in the hospital, maybe a couple months later, still wanting to die and not face life as a double amputee in a developing country, understanding the discrimination for a young man. He hears some laughter outside his window and he looks out and he sees three guys in wheelchairs throwing around a ball and playing wheelchair basketball. And he sees and says, I want that. I want to laugh again. I want to play. I want to live. The thing about faith survivorship is it can be like that, almost like an aha moment, like the light comes in. A exhale, like, oh, I haven't felt that in a while. A recognition of a, suddenly you see a bird and you had been so dark for so long, you never noticed the birds and the flower. I'm, that's being cliche, but I'm saying that choosing life is that opening and moment and can be gradual, it dawns on him, or it can be, I got this, I didn't see it until now. But it is a very um, hopeful space that you hang on to, almost like I say, jumping between bars, like the monkey bars, when you're pulling on one and you're letting go, and you're grabbing another, there is a leap of faith involved in choosing life, the second step. So that brings us to the third step. And again, they aren't linear, like really one, two, three, four, five. They're sort of circular, like three steps forward, two steps back, half, dance, pain, back to the beginning. But these are the ingredients for resilience. So the third step is reach out meaning no one survives alone. No one, in our cases, like in, in, in impact entrepreneurship, no one succeeds alone. You can't have an ounce of impact yourself or a leader leading himself, like, that's fun, stay in your room. The question is, how do you reach out to others, to partners, to the village you need to live and breathe and flourish. And flourishing is not a solitary sport. So reach out, for example, when I was in the hospital, like Jesus, and I was a little down, and sort of feeling sorry for myself, a man walks in the room wearing blue jeans, and he says, I also stepped on a landmine. Can you tell which leg I lost? And he walked back and forth, and he had such a perfect gait or walk that I couldn't tell. And he says, that's my point. Your problem is not down there. Your problem is in here and here. And he said, by the way, do you still have your knee? And I say, yes, like, thankfully. I, it's easier to be a, a below knee amputee than above knee. It's a, it's a nice joint to have. By the way, can you still have children? because of the nature of landmine blast. 
So I have four children now, so I always joke, like, I think that's okay. And he says, what you have is a nose cold, a sniffle. You'll get over it. And he left my room. I never saw him again. I don't remember his name. All I thought to myself is, if that jerk can do it, so can I. So that was sort of Israeli tough love, right? Whereas everyone else is like, oh, poor Jerry, you okay? Do you want some cookies or some apple juice? I didn't need cookies and apple juice. I needed a splash of cold water in my face to say, this will be what you decide it will be. So that's both choosing life. Oh, what if what I have is just a nose cold and in that aha moment, I just reframed disability for me. So we need each other. That's why when we set up a survivor network around the world, it was peer support, like people needing people to help people together. Watson Institute alum, new students, old students, teachers, administrators, financiers, whatever. We all need each other in the ecosystem of survivorship and resilience. Off of this individual crap and also heropreneurship, that any one of us is more special than anyone else is a lie. So back to step one, face facts. You're just clay too. You're just a breath away too. Your $1 left is just $1 left. It's fake and real and mysterious. So reaching out humanizes us, connects us, and that's without social connection, we do wither and die. I kind of like being the turtle. Your temptation in depression and trauma is to withdraw in the shell, not tell anyone what's going on, and you're in trouble if you stay too long. Luckily, some of us have friends who yank our neck out of that shell. And we thank them later. Though we wanted to hide. Isolation, you have to reach out, and in my case, and others will reach out and you have to respond just like I did with that Israeli peer visitor amputee in Israel in 1984. So now I'd ask you guys, write down on the piece of paper, hey, let's have a couple questions. What would reaching, even as we are isolated in COVID, in the time of COVID, how are you reaching out? And don't say Zoom. How are you reaching out in small ways, big ways? They can be text or electronic. They can be prayers, sending energy. How are you in connection and building that connection because staying isolated in COVID for too long, that's why I want my mother out of a room alone. Isolation will kill her, not COVID. COVID's a distraction or a augmentation of what's already there. I believe. So you guys write on your piece, just you know, pause, think what are the facts you're facing? What do you hope would be different? Choose life. And right now, who do you need to reach out to, both for yourself and because also they're in trouble or they're probably more isolated. They may have it worse off than you. So create a little list. Who's reaching out to you and, who are, and how are you reaching out to others? For the sake of survivorship, and survival. Make a long list. We got plenty of time <laughs> these, these days on lockdown, pretending we're busy. Zoom, zoom, zoom in our heads. And if someone died in COVID, who haven't you reached out to because you still haven't forgiven and you have some problem with them. If COVID isn't reminding you how vulnerable and ephemeral this life is, make another list that says, the three people I never wanted to see or reach out to to say sorry or do anything again, and I tried to block, amputate them from my memory. Keep those in look. How might one reach out if we're all just gonna die? <laughs> I'm, being, <laughs> I'm being half tough on you guys, because it's, the early part of survivorship is very sobering 
and isn't like happy days. You guys got enough on your list? Anyone have an example of a way they're reaching out? If you'd like to share, please put it in the chat box and we'll call on you to share out. My biggest fear was that when I had water that I would be drooling in front of you because I can't <laughs> feel my mouth. You're doing great. I'm impressed by how articulate you are even with half of your mouth paralyzed. <laughs> Should we move to get moving? Just let's clap. share, let's have Fabian share out. Justina, I think you aren't able to, to speak out loud. So Fabian, please uh, tell us how you are reaching out to people. Fabian is a Watson alum from Bolivia. Oh, th thank you, Eric. Um, my, sorry, my camera is not working properly. Um, but yeah, I think the way I'm reaching out is, uh, well, first sharing with my family, but also looking for master courses, um, connecting with people and support and trying to support and bring support to, to, to most people possible. It's really important nowadays to, to speak and to listen because um, I think we all need this. And it's uh, first, thank you, Jerry, for sharing your experience. It, it's really getting to me and yeah just to all of you guys you just know that you're amazing you are working hard if you're here it's for a reason and whatever you need you can reach me out i love trying to help people and listening more it's really important for me and for all of you guys thank you very much and i'll just second that because fabian has been very helpful to several watson alums during this time so fabian thank you um, Katie, great. Hi, yes. Yeah. So I, um, I've been lucky and my summer job didn't get canceled as so many people, um, I'm in school, so I had a job, um, coming up this summer and I know a lot of people's jobs did get canceled. Um, not to mention my sister and best friend were both furloughed um and so i've been reaching out to a couple of friends and um offering you know if they need help with rent or if they need help um with other costs because i do have a job and so i want to be able to spread the wealth when i know it's it's a hard time thanks katie so jerry time check we have about 10 minutes left in in the resilient section so um let us know what you think is best. We have a few more comments we can share. Or we can jump into steps four and five. Keep going and see how we do. So on um, step four, after you've been reaching out, and thank you for those comments, because I think they're examples. Sometimes, Fabian, I imagine you're an extrovert. Like sometimes that's easier for some people to do in reaching out, or even if you're in a stronger position. But also for the introverts sometimes, or the, the shyer ones, or the really proud ones, or even me, I'm an extrovert, but I'm proud. Like, I don't want to be needy and I have a hard time asking for help. And th therefore everyone thinks I'm fine. They always think I'm fine and I'm not. So that's another thing is sort of really like everyone is human. Everyone appreciate, appreciates, you know, a high five reach out. All right, get moving means, okay, it could be get moving on your reach out that you are like on your, you know, you're alone, you're depressed and you have to like get up out of bed shave or shower and take steps towards your future. It's a new day, it's today. And sometimes among people who are depressed or have been injured it is, and traumatized, it is highly difficult to do. So don't underestimate what a small movement can be. Standing up straight, you're breathing. The universe gave me my problems. And I know many people who are just like, oh, they'd rather die than lose their leg. And the universe gave you your challenges. 
your before and after moments from your birth date to your death date and these ones in between. And they are yours. You must move on them. I can't do rehab for you. You can't do dental work for me. See what I'm saying? That's where it's your action. Surviving is in movement. If you atrophy and cannot move, then you are dying. So get moving means it's just something, whether it's swimming laps, going to the gym, medit breathing, anything, a thing you do. When it comes to um, the hospital when I was in Israel, here's an example. I'm in the hospital and I finally learned to get in a wheelchair. And I'm exhausted, I've, it's been weeks, I've had blood transfusions, op, you know, six operations, I'm in pain, but now it's time to get the sick boy out of bed and say, the cafeteria is where you will find lunch. And the Israeli nurse who you know, was teaching me, I finally got in, I'm still in a fair amount of pain, and I sort of looked up at her, thinking that she was gonna start wheeling me to lunch. And she looks down at me and laughs and says, if you want to move, then push. She wasn't going to do it for me. And in Israel, it was, there was no coddling, you know, there was no like babying. But in the grit of resilience and survivorship, in the face of disease, death, disaster, destruction, and disability, this is not a joke. There really should be no coddling because truth helps us, not just apple juice. So how are you getting moving? Like in the next day, every day you can make these choices. Every day you can face a new fact, choose life in a new way of hope and gratitude, reach out to a new person or be reached out to and receive and get moving in a new way if yesterday's wasn't really working for you or even today's, we have like hours after this, I can get moving in a new way. And then give back. So that's the special sauce I wanna to bring to the end of, like this is the special ingredient. When I met tens of thousands of landmine survivors and conflict survivors around the world, missing arms, legs, eyes, houses, sisters, brothers, a lot like war is horrific. And let's say someone had a lot of things that happened to them were traumatic. And you said, they're smiling. Why are they smiling? I, I joke, didn't they get the memo about how awful their life is? Missing their limbs and having no house and having watched their daughter killed before them? You would not blame if they stayed in victimhood forever and stood on their head or sucked their thumb or chanted and grieved, rocking in the corner after trauma and war. But after interviewing so many survivors, the ones who got out of victimhood and moved on were the givers. In small ways, big ways, big G, small G, pay forward, pay back, give back, give up, give down, give, 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 give. If it's the only thing that like tricks you to get moving and reach out and choose life, probably is giving. So I guess the question now for you all is on that same sheet of paper with your assignments of what are you moving on how are you giving i mean fabian said like in a way that's part of your giving you're reaching out you know from a checking in and encouraging you have a gift of encouragement i don't know that that's true but it seems i could smell it on the way you talked <laughs> so what is your gift but also how do you give we all have something to contribute and Katie as well, like giving to like trying to check in, you're reaching out to your sister and your friend who have job loss. If they're in victimhood, which is perfectly fine, if they're resenting you, oh fine, it always works out for Katie. She got her job, everyone else is out of work. Lucky star Katie, that's a victim voice. But if it's your sister or your friend, you have empathy and compassion, not like apology, but you understand or you can empathize to the space of how might you have felt in their shoes. And it doesn't mean you shy away from sharing your life of things that good things happen. You just are aware that the, you are just one step away from the symptoms of victimhood. You are just one second away from not having a job. 
you are one second away from having the same fears. So it is a love that holds survivors and victims equally with dignity. And then there's a little bit of this push of giving back. Again, I gave back by starting to, when I felt sorry for myself, and I, they told me to start re wheeling down the hallway of the hospital and go visit the burn ward. I'm terrified of burns, fire. And there's this one guy in room 207 who hasn't spoken to anyone. He was in the Lebanon war, injured. He's almost blind, lost a leg, might lose his next one in the coming month. Jerry, why don't you try to like go teach him English? And when I met this guy, he was as victimhood and as dark and as sad and as depressed as, as I've ever seen anyone. And when I said, when I made fun of him, you look happy. He couldn't see me and he looked up, but he, I said it in English. And he, it was like a dog or someone trying to like tune their ear and like what was, he was like doing this as if who's in the room and who's making fun. And then that's English. In a weird way, the aha moment of choosing life was that was the day we began a lifelong friendship. I was reaching out and giving back because someone had visited me. I'm just visiting someone who's three months behind me in that hospital bed. And we then, he wouldn't speak Hebrew to anyone. He would only speak to me in English. And that led to, he now is a successful lawyer, you know, missing his, you know, legs, but also like very bad eyesight, was blind for a year or two, but now has vague eyesight. But he's a successful lawyer on a Moshav, a farm outside Tel Aviv, married with three kids and happy. Imagine this aha moment for all of us, starting with just like, what if I just turn my chair away and looked at it this way? Or if I just moved away and just said, my gosh, I didn't even think of it that way. So moving and changing perspective is part of this cycle, as you're seeing, you're stirring your ingredients of resilience, you're facing facts, choosing life, reaching out, get moving. So that's why I'm asking, what are you doing in a time of COVID or in trauma in your life to give? And it can be so little. It might be meditating and blessing. I pray and feel send healing and loving energy to my mother who's many, many miles away. And then there's the call or there's the sending of a flower. It's not that I'm even such a great son. It's just because I want to give like she's my mother. That's my tribe, right? In this survivorship and in your work on entrepreneurship, you must get beyond yourself, your family, and your tribe. So it really doesn't count, actually. I mean, it's per of course you should be loving and giving your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and honoring them and yourself. I'm not impressed yet. And you shouldn't be like, oh, Jerry sends his mother flowers every week. Oh, that's such a great son. B.S. Giving is out of comfort zone. It can be small. And it's slightly sacrificial. I don't know if it's 1% to 100%. Some people. So I don't think philanthropists are generous or giving. If you have billions of dollars and give away hundreds of millions and haven't felt an ounce of courage or sacrifice in that giving, and the philanthropy is love of humanity, I don't think you've earned the title philanthropist. You've earned the title of tax savvy person. I don't call that generosity. And then we all bow down to foundations and donors as if that is generosity and giving or paying for it. Maybe. I don't want to sound so tough today after like <laughs> this mouth surgery, but I'm like, this is like the grumpy preneur in Jerry. I'm a curmudgeon, you know, getting older. So I'm just like, come on guys, let's get real. Let's not fake generosity. So lastly, that's, that's mostly it. We have to move from our victim states, which happened. So back to the other question of victimhood of everyday experiences. That's what I'm doing. Like, I didn't know someone's gonna be pulling out my tooth today or that two days ago I would have shooting pains and that I can't like eat. And then it's an emergency that, and they said I couldn't meet till next week. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, suffer through. I'll be a victim. 
Um, I didn't know what each day we have these opportunities. This is not to say it's a perfect formula, but when I'm in a bad day like today, or I joke that stepping, stubbing my toe for me is worse than stepping on a landmine. Because when you're a leader, you're used in a dramatic moment, a crisis, dun, 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 I've got this. But stubbing my toe alone in my house and swearing as if I have Satan in my mouth is not pretty. And I know, and I'm like, oh, I didn't sleep well and I stubbed my toe and spilled my coffee. And I start thinking, this is gonna be a shitty day. I start self-pity, resenting, didn't get any sleep, if only, blaming, oh, Jerry, you should be even, you know, done, blaming myself even. So I'm saying victimhood can show up in little rotten ways and the more mature you get and resilient, you know just how to catch it faster. Oh, I got a whiff of victimhood or like Jerry, or my own daughter would say to me, dad, read your own book <laughs> on how to become a survivor and resilient. So I take it. So I give it, you know, I'm giving you a little salt, salt and sugar and spice here because of my hope for you to move forward in impact entrepreneurship. You better be able to go the distance and you better be able to develop resilience. And that's where we come to this idea of it is not something that you're born with. Thankfully, it's something you get in shape for. So the studies on resilience from Yale and elsewhere in the United States are like optimism. You could say that's semi-genetic. Yeah arguable. Every other one, look at these guys. Think about them. Altruism, hello, give back. Moral compass, faith and spirituality, hello, choose life. You know, humor, having a role model, social support, hello, reach out. Facing fear, facts, having a mission, get moving, training. These are things you do. However, if you aren't resilient, the good news is you can go to the gym of resilience and start right now. So you are in shape for what's coming in terms of crises in your life and the loss of loved ones and trauma. It's just called life and there's a cost. And we have a Reef Khan who um, has a comment that he'd like to share about how he is giving back. A Reef, can you share? Perfect. Hi, yes, yes. Hi, I'm Reef. So, um, so um, one thing that I've been doing actually. So, um, I don't know if if um some of you know what what Publix is, but um, it's a grocery store. So, I actually work there. And um, one thing, so um, there is this family friend I know. So, um, but um, their family has a lot of heart issues, and um, they're not as you know rich as. So, <clears throat> so what I've been doing actually is um doing their their grocery shopping for them. That way, they don't have to come outside and do it on themselves. Seeing that for them, it's more of a risk than it is on myself. So um so after work you know I would stop by over there at their house and you know um drop off their groceries so that's one thing I've been doing to reach out to them and um you know give back at the same time. I love it. Thank, thank you, Arif. And Arif is actually joining Watson Institute at Lynn University this coming year. So congratulations. We're excited to have you with us. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So would again, any yeah, Jerry, go for it. We're sort of moving on towards like, and then we'll take a teeny like two minute break, I think. But this idea of post-traumatic growth, even, you know, they say post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, and you, everything is psychologized and you need therapy. And most of the world doesn't have therapy. Most of the world, the question is how do we get through collective trauma, you know, on the issues of the world, catastrophes, floods, fires, COVID, pandemics. So there is such a thing as post-traumatic growth which actually is like experienced by victims who become even more resilient and helpful and they become stronger leaders. So you want to have leaders who are you know, true to survivorship and have those hallmarks of generosity, humor, one of the number one signs of resilience, you know, being able to courage, inspiration, empathy. So even in our politics, whether from where you live or your own aspiration as a leader, 
people can have victim space, you know, and you have to listen to victim language and say, is that the type of leader you want in politics or in your community, or even as you run an organization? What does a resilient and courageous and honest leader look like? You can be, and it's, it's always growing and it's never static. So lastly, before we shift to maybe take a little, I just need to take a very quick break, um, is the, I wrote that book called Getting Up and, you know, Life Knocks You Down. And so this is, again, a long time story. I've had other traumas in my life, but this is probably the most visible and it led to giving back through the development of the Landmine Ban Treaty or doing laws and policies for people with disabilities around the world. So one of the ways that I gave back was this sort of collective service for humanity to ensure that there were rights for all and to, to change laws and policies at an international level so that we could stop the bleeding from landmines, for example, and make sure that people got legs, like me, got jobs, and got on with their lives even after their worst day. So I thought that's good. And after a while, when I was doing like Eric or like any of you running an organization or getting through life and you know, had young children, family, I was still rather uh, blessed with a full life. I was getting kind of tired. And I was like, oh, you know, all this talk about resilience. I'm just sort of like, I never liked the word, but it came up. Burning out. You know, sort of working, a workaholic. No one complained even my family because i was doing good work for the good of others so you can't add it's hard to criticize like a noble path but was it also noble path doesn't mean it doesn't have illness in it so one day i'm having dinner with a board member in like california and she goes jerry you've done so much you could just retire and relax like you know three or four treaties plus the what you've done like why are you so driven why are you you remind me of a donkey a donkey with a carrot in front of it, chasing. What are you chasing? What is your carrot? Why do you do all these things? Why are you obsessed with peaking the next peak? And I didn't know what she meant, but I knew she saw me. And I didn't like the picture of myself as a donkey and I hadn't thought of it. So I probably changed the subject. I fled instead of facing facts. And then she goes, do you have um, a spiritual discipline, Jerry? I was like, what do you mean, like that yoga? She was like, calm down. No, do you like, do you breathe or? I said, I have faith, got defensive. I'm spiritual. She goes, no, just, can you breathe? Like, you mean meditate? Whatever, can you sit still? And can you breathe? Like, let's say for, this is what I would say, for 60 seconds for tomorrow, take 60 seconds, one minute, and sit still and breathe. Empty yourself. And the second day, another 60 minutes. I mean, 60 seconds. And then the second month, do two minutes. The third month, three minutes. By the end of a year, she said, you will have what I call a spiritual discipline. And I thought spiritual discipline meant like I'd have to like learn Sanskrit or go become like a yogi and you got to have a guru and say Vipassana and all these like big words that I can't possibly ever remember. And she broke it down. So the next day, this is important for us entrepreneurs who get very busy creating and working. I had my coffee. I had my cell phone turned up. Then I sat there and tried to breathe 60 seconds. Started the timer. reached for the phone, looked at it, like 26 seconds. Shoot, start over. What's wrong with me? Press, do it again, breathe. She said, just count two, three, four, hold two, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, bring in and out. And I tried a technique just counting. And then I reached for my coffee and took a sip. 37 seconds. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? I'm spiritually obese. 
I'm sick. I can't go to the, like, I can't do one sit up of breathing at the gym. So I, from that point, I realized that I was burning out for a reason. I was too, working too much. I was doing, doing, doing. So the secret step that wasn't in the book about resilience, but is key for sustaining and regenerating yourself is a step that my youngest, my oldest daughter gave me when she was about four years old. We were playing a game and I'm one of these like awful fathers who's sort of competitive. I never let my kids beat me at a game. They play me tennis, they can lose 6-0 and learn to play properly. <laughs> so I was a doer and a competitive guy. So there I was with my daughter playing some silly game, I'm sure. And clearly I'm getting all too into it. And she says to me, Daddy, relax, relax. And of course she was meaning to say relax. And I'm thinking she's just trying to be cute to trick me into like beating me at this game. Like that's, that's how sick I am. So I was like, ha 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 ha, still. And it has occurred to me many, many, many years later how wise and beautiful that message from my daughter was. B. Lax. Like today's enough. The beach is enough. The rain is enough. You're enough. The challenges of the today are for today. There's no sense unbeing relaxed, be unlax. And so, but for us entrepreneurs, we can become addicted to doing rather than seeing and being. And that's what the second hour will get us driving deeper into. So happy to answer any questions right now as we sort of close the first section on resilience, Eric. Um, follow your leadership and then just give me about 90 seconds. Thanks, Jerry. Why don't you take 90 seconds? And if anyone has any questions, and Jerry, if you need more than 90 seconds, okay. that's okay too. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat box. And we'll ask them once, once, once Jerry's back. I also put the link to Jerry's book uh, in the chat box as well, in case anyone's interested. I'm back. Great. Welcome back. Um, Arlington Rogers, would you like to share your question? Oh, yeah. I, I just had a simple question, of course, just, you know, aside from your own, you know, experience, what are some like books or maybe like lectures that you listen to that kind of change your view on, you know, resiliency and victimhood and stuff like that and help you helps you, you know, create that mind? Hmm. Sorry, just they told me I'm supposed to be icing and not talking, so I'm doing half of the instruction on and off. Good question. I think back to having a competitive advantage on, even though I re rebelled against the breathing and meditation at first, I have thought of spiritual questions on my own seeking journey in life. So I think um, when you say lectures and whatnot, it's thinking of like, who's, the, who's that poet, you know, sort of Donahue or Mary Oliver, or who's that um, Buddhist monk, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh. Or who, so I found that I, or what's the Psalm? 
in the Hebrew Bible. Or, or, oh yeah, I haven't read the Beatitudes in a while. So it comes from ancient wisdom, poetry, scripture, um, yeah, things that feed the soul. Because um, we're always learning, right? Like that's the easy, like by the time you, you know, follow the news or finish your master's program or study, you know, undergrad, you're learning, you're really very often over-exercising your brain muscle, your head, and you really are under or maybe like running away from your feelings, your heart, or you're so busy doing. So those are the mind, body, and heart connection to be a whole person and keep that in balance is very important. But beyond that, the spirit and the soul, however you define it, even as your ultimate or higher self or deepest energy or inner capability, there is something more that others call it consciousness or collective consciousness. So I read and listen to tapes and think a lot about that side of what does it mean to surrender? Um, so I'm cut, maybe it's like, I'm, yeah, I feel like most of like, if I wake up in the middle of the night and put on headphones or it might be Eckhart Tolle, like the power of now, like these things that are sort of not part of my day job, but are essential that's what I listen to and try to breathe. So anything in that front, um, it used to be that everyone at Christmas or birthday would give me a book on like war, conflict or humanitarian work, you know, human rights, because that's how they saw me, like a leader in human rights. I must love this. I was like, what? But I love like a book on refugees? Like it's like my day job. And I love the people. I don't like the conditions. So I always thought it was funny. I never read those books that were trying to teach me or to be better at something. Instead, I am a sponge for, yeah, that encouragement. And they're, they're shorter books. I, I don't think I've gotten through a full book in a long while. I read pieces of books. Everyone thinks I'm like sort of smart somehow. I think it's just because, maybe because I read so many chapters, so, so few chapters of so many books that I pick up a lot of random stuff. I don't know, but I think it's funny. I was like, no, I'm like, it's hard for me to get through a book, but the ones, the ones I get through, I'm telling you, are, you know, soul food books. Thanks, Jerry. Time check and Arlington, great question as well. Um, we hope to see you in Boulder. I believe you have applied for the Boulder Accelerator. So um, great to have you here with us. And Jerry, time check, we've got about 35 minutes left. Thanks. And I know we have a breakout group that we'd like to get to as well. Great. Let's jump right into that. So I'm gonna pull up some slides and then for briefly to get us into our assignment again. So here we go, can you see that? Now, come on. Whoop, 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 there. Okay, so now we're getting into the compass like alignment, which was the other lesson we wanted to cover today for you as leaders. How do you align being who you are, seeing how we change the world and why things are so awful at times, and then doing what we know. As I was just saying, the doing what we know is sort of the easy piece, like you have a CV or you learn how to speak a language or you learn skills in Excel or you are an organizer. So we aren't really worried, we overdo the doing muscle, particularly in the West. The hard one is that middle one, What's the pattern and the purpose and the vocation? Where do we burn for change? And that's a tricky one, but we're gonna start with the outer circle, which I would say is that soul circle, the wisdom circle, the being circle. So just as you look at these on, again, on that piece of paper, just sort of jot down a couple words that come to mind to you. Um, when you think of Gandhi, an icon, just write down two nouns or qualities or words that come to mind. Don't overthink it. Just Gandhi, from whatever you know in history, or looking at this picture, a couple words on a piece of paper. Jot them down. Mandela, 26 years in prison, South Africa, political icon of the last century. So when you think of Nen Mandela leaving prison and leading South Africa post apartheid, again, Couple words, don't overthink them, jot them down on a paper.
even if you don't know so much of their history, just look at the face, feel like you don't, let's say you never saw this man, what are you feeling when you see him? Feel it in your body, feel it deeper than just your head, don't overthink. Malala. Talk about overcoming, like what would you do if you were shot in the face? For no good reason. So what do you think of Malala, Pakistan? What do you admire most in her? Two words, jot them down, don't overthink them. All right, now to the exercise. Some of you have done this. It's just getting towards who you are being in the world. So who's your icon? It could be one of the ones we just saw. The only rule with this game and breakout session is to think who's your most admired hero or just someone you look up to, but it can't be a family member. I know in the sort of Eastern and Asian countries, very often it's sort of more a Western thought of a superhero or a hero or icon, but there are icons throughout the world in literature and history, even in cartoons. So it doesn't really matter. The only rule is it can't be a family member where Asian families very often say, oh, it's my grandmother or my you know, grandfather or my father. So you tend, people tend to pick in their family and before this exercise, that's the only rule. It can't be a family member. Could be a coach or teacher, could be Eric people you look up to, and then ask yourself why. What are the three things that I dig about Eric? What are the qualities, like why do I, but you know, even if you, it's a historical figure, like you know, someone who died, like Abraham Lincoln, one of my heroes, President Lincoln from the Civil War in America. Pick your hero, write that person's name down, Don't over, you can pick, you can write down three if you want, it doesn't, and then you'll land on one. And then write down the three qualities that you think you admire most. So I'll just pause for you know 60 seconds for you to sort of get the three qualities. Try to express them as nouns. So instead of like compassionate, say compassion. And make them high qualities, like think of like peace, joy, love, you know, compassion, justice, not just like they're smart or hardworking. That's too much in the doing circle. So pick your hero, list three qualities as a noun, so as a thing, not just an adjective or quality. But we can walk through them and break up. And if you've done this before, try just picking and playing around, just pick another hero, like over the last couple of years, you sort of like, just play with it, a historic one or current one, and then see if the, the exercise still works for you. Or what new you might learn from thinking about another hero or role model. All right, so you've got this. So I'm gonna stop the share for now and ask if there's like a volunteer that we're gonna do like one per, like as an example now together. And then we're gonna go into breakout of three people, I think. And then you'll do it with each other and we'll come back and share with the group. But just as a example together, so you can see how I'm thinking and why the exercise, how the exercise works, who wants to volunteer? So tell us about your hero and the three qualities. Feel free to just unmute yourself if you'd like to be our courageous volunteer. I can go. <clears throat> Is it okay? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Okay. So it's Ramadan and I have been reading all our prophets, their lifestyle. So I have been through uh, this one of the prophets uh, in our religion, Yunus. Um, he's also named, uh, known as Jonah. And I have been reading about him a lot, like how he ended up in the stomach of a whale and uh, how he survived, how um, Almighty helped him uh, to get out of position. So I just got a belt. I get a belt over and over about the, like how he tackled the situation, how he overcome. So um, I really, right now, I'm really looking upon him. And three things about him really um, amazes me is uh, he's very resilient, he's courageous, and um, he's humble. Like he he has been through so much, but still he's being humble, not complaining. Um, he's being resilient and also being courageous. So these are the three things. Um, yeah. I think many have heard the story of Jonah who's been sent by God, you know, to like tell people who, uh, that they're going to perish. So there are variations on the story in mythology, in the Hebrew and sort of Christian Bibles, as well as in the Quran. Islam. And so yeah. Eunice, Jonah, thinking about this is very interesting. Like what happens when you're in the belly of a whale? That's a crisis. And how do you overcome? So Eve, you say about like, so the, the three words, if I turn them into nouns, which you guys can do, would be like, instead of resilient, I say resilience. Resilience, courageous. Instead of courageous, courage. I say courage. courage. Instead of humble, I turn it into a noun or a quality and say humility. Mm. So that's the first thing to sort of catch on each other is like what's the what's the noun version? I know it sounds grammatical, but it's it's a it's an essence, not just an adjective. Then I go to you Eve and say resilience. We just had a long chat on resilience, right? And yes. I just said, like, resilience is something you do. Like, I, too, thought, like, resilience might be something that's high up there. And it's a good word. I love it. But I just taught you that it's part of the doing. You can get in shape for resilience. You become more. It's like, like if you said, I just really admire Jonah and his fitness, very muscular, and was able to swim for many miles out of the whale. Like, so it, we're trying to get at a higher quality of being so what do you think is the word that's bigger than resilient or resilience? Think of, think of even the chart I was showing, like words that are above. Because resilient, yeah, again, something, principles are things you do or behavior. So if you said disciplined or smart or hardworking, I would also call foul in this exercise saying, that's not big enough, go higher. What would you do above resilience or picking another word? Again, thinking of Jonah and your hero. So get out of your head. Give me, go, give me two seconds. <laughs> yeah. Like go back into the belly and be with Jonah's energy. Of course he's resilient, but what is it above that? I don't know how to put it in one word, but uh, mental strength, like having a very strong mental, maybe it's also related to courage. Mm. But you Maybe have courage picture. already. Mm -hmm. Like very strong minded, not collapsing with the situation. You know, I don't know how to put it in one word. So let's say, so now we play the game. Everyone will do it. Like you're at the, I have glasses, you see. So when you go to the optometrist, the eye doctor, they're like, is this clear or that clear? Do you see that one better or that better? Is it E or the F? So you know what that means, right? So now we just refine with you and say, you picked a category of word, resilience, and then you went higher and said strength or strong. But mm. you said you weren't sure you love that word and it's sort of like courage, but then you play with other words. So if I said, is it strength or fortitude? And again, these are English words. So everyone, you can have a favorite word in your language that you feel not just you say. So do you like the word strength or fortitude? Strength. I would like strength. Okay, strength. Do you like strength or like willfulness? Strength, yeah. Strength or willfulness? Yes, like strong, strong mental will. I think 
willful i'll choose strength over willful Great. yeah willpower or will willpower, willpower of or course strength. willpower yeah willpower there's something again in that strong of resilience that's in the choice category you're like the willing your future and being willing to surrender to the facts willpower is huge choice is also a big word like in the, in the more mystical sense so resilience is a good word but this one means is there a word that's missing? And then you say, do you like strength or fortitude or perseverance or like pick a bunch of words in the category, like you had a thesaurus, like you, and you're like, oh, and you can do this later. This is just the fast version and say like, oh, I love your know, strength. It sounds so simple. But then when we, now for you, draw a Venn, everyone, draw a Venn diagram. You know what that is? Three circles and put a heart in the middle. So this, your three circles. Heart in the middle, that's you, Eve. And then put, you have courage, strength, and humility. Is that correct? So you're starting to say, this is sort of your essence, like the, your three inner superpowers that you will paint with. Your leadership will reflect them. When you do that, though, you see a pattern. Like, huh, they all need each other. And you're like, huh. Like you said in conversation, strength and courage or sort of in the same, they aren't the same, but they're in the same sort of family. Humility is a different color. Mm -hmm. Strength and courage. Like strength, you know, that might be like greens and like fiery red and orange for strength and courage. Humility might be like watery blue or like clear, like something, I'm just making it up, but colors have energies, words have energies, and these essence, which is you, you have to decide, huh, if I put, move strength into courage and just sort of I can, you can have a sub color and a main color what am i missing in my third circle we don't we're going to do it in groups so i'm just leaving it for everyone you saying i think courage is like something you said courage and that's leading with your heart that's not bravery bravery is not big enough an english word that's something mm -hmm. you do and skilled in armor and war courage is in the face of fear leading by your heart you overcome so courage is a big one. Strength might be a subset. And then humility is a huge one. When someone declares humility, so you now have to say, Ava, so follow my lead and then we'll practice later. My name is Eve. Say it. My name is Eve. Your name is not who you are. So let's not, and you know, in your CV and you being a director of anything or being on this list or that list, that's irrelevant to this. And your name is almost irrelevant. It's a powerful name. You could have picked Eve. But you picked something else. So then you say, my name is Eve, and I stand for courage, strength, and humility. Try it. My name, my name is Eve, and I stand for courage, strength, and humility. And then you say it again. My name is Eve. I stand for courage. I stand for strength, humility, and, for strength mm -hmm. and mix it up to see if we can feel your energy. Don't act, just feel it, don't think it. My name is Eve and I stand for courage, strength and humility. Can you say my name is Eve? Don't forget that part, say like, I am strength, I am courage, I am humility. I am strength, I am courage, and I am humility. It's really powerful. And also your audience, whether they know you or not, like, and the, someone can start to feel if we had like a quick vote, how did you guys feel when she said those words? Some people know you and be like, oh, that's her. Others might be like, I don't know, but I, when she said the word humility, I felt it. I was like, when you said the word humility, I felt it like a deep, important authenticity there. I felt some confusion. I felt encouraged and strength as well. I felt like, oh, that's one of your big colors, but I feel it's not in its fullness. So that's why we all you know, can work on this a little bit. And that's why we're gonna go into a breakout session. So we're gonna break into groups of three and you're gonna do just what we did. Who's your hero? Share it with the other. What are the three qualities? Don't go into long, like, well, did you know that this historic person did what they did in history? We don't have time for that. So move towards who's the hero. Maybe it's a poet no one's ever heard of, but then move towards equalities. You can give a couple reasons why, but don't go into their life story. Just 
I love this person. I admire these three qualities. This is what I think they are, but I'm sort of struggling with the third. And just play with it a while and then peer support each other to say, go in order and you know, with some pace and try to not be so much in your head. Like, don't think about someone else and like, what will they think of me? Just go to your heart. Like, what do you feel if you get to have lunch with Jonah or like Gandhi or Mandela and you're excited and their energy is in the room what are those three things you love that you get to have lunch with and be in the presence of? So let's break out and then we're gonna come back and share a couple learnings from that. This is very important. It's the beginning of vision and values for your leadership. If you cannot do this and you do not know yourself, back to step one, what's blocking you from knowing yourself and then standing in who you are for such a time as this. Alberto, thank you, Jerry. Alberto will put us in breakout groups in a second. I wrote down the instructions in the chat box. So please just quickly copy those so that you have them. And Alberto, in about 10 seconds, why don't you put everyone into uh, breakout groups? Yes, of course. If you guys are ready now, I can go ahead and open it up. Let's do it. We'll call you back in how many minutes? 10, you said? 10 minutes is what we have. Does that sound good, Jerry? Yeah. Great. All right, everyone. You're going to see a little window pop up on your screen um, asking to join a breakout room. Uh, feel free to go ahead and click that, and you'll be sent to your appropriate breakout room. So Alberto, for those who have not joined a breakout group, group, group yet, is that just because they have not pressed the button? Uh, yes, correct. If you guys look at your screen, you should have got a request to join a uh, breakout room. Let's see if I can send it again, just a second.
I have about two and a half minutes on my side, Eric. Thank you, thank you. Alberto, can you resend Lalis's invitation? It looks like it didn't go through for some reason. Sorry about that, I was muted. Uh, uh, invitation for what? For the breakout room? Oh, I'll her to a breakout room, I can. Lalas, at least you'll be able to join perhaps the last minute. Sorry about that, Lalas. I have 30 seconds. All right, time's up. I'm going to bring back. Sounds good. The break rooms are closing up as we speak. Great. Welcome back, everybody. I think there may be a few people straggling in, but Jerry, can we turn it back to you to close things out? We, have, we only have about five minutes remaining. Great. So we'll do a rush job. Who wants to jump in and um, say who they are? Do we have a brave volunteer? Just like Eve did, who's our next victim. McKindy, I see you. I know you're courageous. Anybody want to volunteer? Shy people, I if you guys want to be impact entrepreneurs, you got to jump in faster, even if you don't feel like it. Hi. 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 Oh, okay. Never mind. You go ahead. <laughs> oh, you can go if you want to. Barbetta, you were first. Uh, okay. So, hi, my name is Ines. 
Barbisha is the name of my startup. I don't know why it just came up. Um, I was telling my friends, uh, thank you for the exercise. It was really awesome. I got to know two amazing people. And um, so I am love, I am joy, and I am faith. And I think these three words kind of really describe the person that I am and inspired to be in the future. You can say, my name is Ines and I stand for love, joy, and faith. And now I'm gonna ask one other thing that's important for impact entrepreneurs, not just yourself. My name is Ines and I stand for love, joy, and faith for myself and for others, or for humanity. So it has to go beyond. These are not, gifts are not for you to just hang on to and be yourself. They are transcendent aspects that flow through you and imprint your leadership on this earth. So let's try that one, Ines. I am love, I am joy, I am faith for myself and for others. My name is Ines. I am love, I am joy, I am faith, and I stand for myself and for others through so these three qualities. <laughs> Was that hard to do? Does it feel true? No, it just felt right, I think. It just resonated really good. Well, I know we don't have much time, so I know that maybe one other person want to take a stab at this. Thank you, Ines. One more. Well, let's well, see. So my name is McKendy. I'm McKendy. Uh, and I stand for um, integrity, um, collaboration, and catalyst. Uh, uh yeah what was your third one you had integrity collaboration and catalyst catalyst yes so this will take a little more counseling but i'm going to just say so integrity is one of those big words almost like resilience that can go either way mm -hmm. integrity and its root definition is like integral wholeness soundness those are very big words so i, I I'll, I'll stand with integrity when you shift to i am collaboration that's like a type of behavior and then also if you say I'm catalyst, that also is an enzyme that triggers something. So mm -hmm. that's dropping down into maybe how you manifest or your principles in the world. So I take a stab under behind collaboration, what's the higher word? So yeah, you partner, you cooperate, you coordinate, you collaborate, you do all your C words, but that's not who you are. Who is McKendy? Or who is your hero and what's bigger than collaboration? Um, so uh, maybe I say I stand for truth, uh, but that goes along with integ integrity. Uh, geez. Um, <laughs> so I'm feel fearless, courageous. Um, yeah, those are the, yeah. You just, so you then have to say catalyst. You're like, it's a part of leadership and charisma to be a catalyst. And like is it inspiration is it courage like a heart piece so you we won't have time to like walk you through but you can walk through with your teams or with eric and others and watch in because it's worth you knowing what are your highest or deepest like superpowers because that's your mm -hmm. whether you work at a coffee shop or the government or like a empanada bar like you bring mckendy in the room which means your name is mckendy and you bring courage integrity and blank i don't know i don't know you uh fearless that's courage so fearlessness fearlessness or courage take your pick which do you like fearlessness courage uh, courage okay pick courage so we're we have courage and we have integrity we're still missing something what's behind collaboration pick one don't overthink uh, it okay fearless resilient courage integrity oh god uh 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 in your heart, just I... yell out a word. <laughs> Nothing is coming to mind. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> but if you just for now say, because you're collaborative, that means you like other people. So you have a good smile. You could say, I am joy. I am love. I am smile. Oh, jo and joy and love. Okay. Uh, like, yeah. Why was that so hard to find? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it's like my anxiety is all kicking in. You ha it's, it's a deeper exercise than what we're doing because then mm -hmm. who you are. So now as we close, draw, you do, everyone draws their Venn diagram, their three you know, circles with their three qualities. You're in the middle. And then you know and practice and you know, in front of others, like I, my name is, 
and I stand for blank, blank, and blank for myself and for others. And you're in service, you're in leadership. So therefore, all of you must be for yourself and for others, for humanity. It's really not about you, no matter how special you think I think you are, <laughs> or Air Watson thinks you are, no matter how special we think Eric is. <laughs> but who he is comes to the world and is being shared generously with all of us. He is in service. That's beautiful as one of my role models, Eric. So then you can do that. Now, now put, lastly, you want to do three concentric circles. So you know what that is? Like three circles, one outer one, a middle one, and an inner one. So just like a target practice, three concentric circles. And we're going to close with this. Right, Eric? Correct. With a couple minutes left, maybe. In the outer ring, put your words, courage, humility, justice, love, whatever your three dominants are, your three main colors, put that in the outer ring. That's essential for your soul's imprinted leadership for the planet. We're gonna pause there. The middle ring, just so you know, that you know, the outer ring is that your, your wisdom, your being. And then the inner ring is your seeing and your understanding of patterns or what you burn for. So let's say you have a project at Watson or you wanna study like impact entrepreneurship. The question is, what do you burn for and why? So we're just going to close with you having to fill in the blanks after I move on here, wait. So then look, so you saw the first exercise, that's the outer ring. You put those three qualities there. That should contain and be transcendent, even a dotted line, because it's like, it's not just coming from you, it's almost trans beyond you, but it's in you and you must manifest that in your leadership. The other is, the second middle is what makes you burn for humanity, for justice? Is it the environment? Is it like biodiversity? Is it like children and abuse? Is it war and peace? Almost like picking one of the sustainable development goals. Pick a category that you read about or really, it's, pardon my language, pisses you off. So it can be like, what's your passion? Sometimes these language is too hard, but what, make, what do you read on the weekends that people don't know? What's your thing? Guys, only you know your thing. That's a clue to your vocation. So if who you are is not lining with your thing, then I don't know how long it's going to sustain with what you do. So do you have that courage to take a stand? When I'm talking about leadership, it's courage. It's not just being a peacemaker, making everyone have conflict averse. The stuff as an impact preneur means you are disrupting the status quo for the good of others and the planet and its people and prosperity. So it's gonna take people who oppose you and getting beyond the status quo. That takes courage, and courage meaning leading with your heart, but with a willpower that knows who you are and has a moral compass. Lastly, the inner circle that is the knowledge. What are you you're doing? So you have your being out, seeing the patterns and what you stand for, and then what do you do day to day? How do you contribute with excellence? Some people are finance, some people are accounting, some people are leadership, some people are talkers like me, some people are dreamers like me, some people are, but you have things, you, you have a language or two, you have, you know how to do Excel, you can speak, you can organize. I, those are, this is the easiest part because it's how you're manifested doing. When I told you that I didn't know what that carrot was, like I was addicted to doing. And then I was being rewarded, but it didn't satisfy who I was and my soul's calling in leadership for the world. So that's the thing, and this is one of my mon mentors, Monica Sharma, who I look up to, and I want all of you to know, like, you already are self-selecting for Watson as alumni or students or impact entrepreneurs. You wanna make a difference, be a change maker, that's great. And it is important that uh, you aren't so special, that everyone has a role in being a change maker. You have an innate ability to commit to action when you get out of your own way and all those self dose and that, that voice in your head saying, you're not humble, you're not courageous, you're not, that voice is there. Your mind will attack that one. Unless you know who you are, you can't stand or fight that storm. Therefore, your leadership won't stand. So as human beings, we get into action by standing in our values and then minding, not thinking that it's just special people who are leaders, we all are called at least to lead our own lives, manage our own lives, and change and manage the change in our own lives. So that's it to, to, to wrap up. You're, you're align, when you don't align who you are, your value set and your inner capabilities, 
with how you see the world and your work, your vocation, shifting policy, culture, norms for what's wrong in the world to what's right for others, and you don't do it with excellence, your skills that you're good at things, then you'll be unhappy. You're misaligned. You're leaking out fragments of energy. So this is where what flow comes from and flourishing comes from is actually when these things are in motion. And some of you, I bet if we had more time, would understand, describe what it feels like when you're in flow or flourishing, thriving. And it's because of this, I promise you. These things have connected the dots. And that's what Watson is doing, alignment, so that you can be mini transformers for the good of the planet and humanity. And for that, I really am deeply like, uh, grateful forever. Like that, to know you all and to know that you are seeding a garden of what I call transpreneurship or impact entrepreneurship that will be bigger than yourselves. It doesn't mean it has to be so global. It could be like literally in your community, like as a fractal, as small is the new big. And if you aren't doing in your community, or you're, if I was just working on landmines in Cambodia, but didn't call the United States out on like, why hasn't joined the mine ban treaty? And why is it part of the problem? A, where's my courage? And B, where's my work at home? And inside me, have I demined? Have I removed the landmines from my own heart of bitterness and sadness and pain? See what I'm saying? So aligning your inner work with your community work where you live and you are planted and your larger work if it transcends and can scale for the world. And I'm telling you, small and authentically aligned is the new big. So with that, I'll leave you with my gratitude that you guys are on the front lines at Watson. Bravo, Jerry. A huge heartfelt thank you from all of us from across the world. Um, I mean, during this time, to understand resilience, but also at a deeper level in some ways to understand alignment. Like you said, it's what unleashes a tremendous amount of power and strength in all of us when who we are is aligned with what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it. When those things are aligned, there's a tremendous amount of power and energy that gets unleashed. And I'm thrilled that we could all hear this wisdom, especially during this time, um, because this is really the time to make like Jerry said, to start small in our communities in a deeply aligned way, because that's what's going to truly change the world. Um, Jerry, we're honored to have you as a master course teacher. Thank you to everyone who joined from, from even those who stayed up in many different parts of the world. Have a good evening, have a good day wherever you are, and, and please stay well and stay strong. Thank you all, blessings. Stay safe and Thank courageous. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Jerry. You, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. guys. Take, Take care. care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.